Do you know what a perfect steampunk samurai western fantasy game looks like? I do. It's called Kenshi and can simply be described as a post-apocalyptic pain simulator. It's a game where everything shits on you. What you do, how you do it, what constitutes your end goal is all up to you and limited only by your imagination. A sandbox RPG slash RTS hybrid with a post-apocalyptic theme, squad building, base building, and one of the best faction reactive worlds you'll ever play in. For some, Kenshi ends up being a game about creating stories and epic tales of survival. What you're about to watch is my story of what it was like surviving Kenshi. For the past two weeks, there hasn't been another game that has captivated me as much as Kenshi has. I have been playing this game non-stop, religiously, to the point where my family doesn't know where I am, and have likely issued a search and rescue party for me. For a game that was developed primarily by one man over the course of 12 years, known for being notoriously brutal and unforgiving, this literal sandbox has taken my soul, beat me over the head with it, and forced my hand into making a video about my time playing it. Upon starting a new save, Kenshi asks you to choose one of many game starts, sort of like a backstory for your character. I chose the start where you begin as a poor, starving drifter with a recently adopted puppy friend. Why? Because who doesn't want a puppy? Why roam the post-apocalyptic wastes alone when you can do that and more with a good boy? <coughs> There are a lot of things in the world of Kenshi that can kill you. From roaming bandits, cannibals, or your friendly pack of rabid, man-eating wolves. In the beginning, the threat of death was my own human requirement for nourishment. My character was slowly starving to death, her hunger meter was critically low, and her stats indicated that she was malnourished, a coveted feature among supermodels and anti-food activists alike. I feared that she might be blown away by the next gust of air, so I had to find her some food as soon as possible. I checked one of the rundown buildings in the area, and to my surprise, I found a lifetime supply of absolutely nothing. Not a crumb of food in sight. In fact, a lot of the buildings here were like this one, all except one. There was a house further into town that looked to be untouched, so I sent my gaunt little friend over there to inspect it and watched her shamble away. It appeared that we weren't alone in this place, as there was another person with the same idea heading towards the building. I took that as a good sign. Perhaps we could find some food after all. Inside, I was greeted with silent stares from the squatters of this fine establishment. Luckily for my malnourished friend, they took one glance at her. After counting each one of her ribs, decided that she wasn't worth wasting what precious energy they had left attacking her. So they left her alone. Unfortunately, whatever was here before was already picked clean. Disappointed, my character took to a dirty bedroll in the room and went to sleep hungry. The next morning, our search for food continued. Maybe one of the squatters knew something I didn't. The location of another town or city, I thought. Silence is all I got from them. But before I left, one of the squatters suggested I take the puppy that was in the room. Something about shitting everywhere and eating all of their food. And that is how I imagine the story of how my character finds herself with a little puppy friend. With another mouth to feed, the search for food was more important than ever. I couldn't let this good boy starve, so we left the homeless shelter and made our way out of the ruined city. We passed the crumbling city walls and reached the outskirts. No weapon, no food. The future didn't look good for my anorexic friend and her furry companion. Danger lurked just around the corner. In fact, the pair made it only 500 feet away from the city borders when I noticed the horde of cannibals in front of them. These savages appeared to have already caught whatever or whomever they were hunting and were now hauling away their meal. <coughs> The agonized screams from the unlucky survivors was our cue to clear the hell out of there, so we turned tail and ran the other way. Down the hill, I noticed more activity as we witnessed a small battle nearby. Two warring factions were duking it out. Swords clashed and blood was shed as the soldiers fought on. It was all very dramatic. I especially enjoyed watching the armored praying mantis foot dive into the other guy's face. 
We watched from afar as a surviving humanoid bug man attempted to revive his fallen companion, but it seemed to be too late. I waited until the bug man left to loot the bodies, hoping to find food or at the very least a weapon for my character to defend herself with, creeping ever so slowly towards the battlefield, eager to scavenge some high tier loot. But all I got was mediocre armor, freshly soaked in blood, and a massive sword that I was surprised my character could even lift. Still no food. At this rate, the duo was surely going to starve out. Unwilling to let starvation get me down, I soldiered on. Pushing through a dust storm that had suddenly decided to blow its load everywhere, we encountered more empty ruined buildings in our travels. It was as if the game was trying to tell me something. Perhaps it was foreshadowing the future. A future where I would end up empty and ruined just like these buildings. Since I already lived that reality, I shrugged it off and continued my merry way deeper still into the post apocalyptic wastes of Kenshi. Before I knew it, the sun had gone down and darkness was setting in. Afraid I was going to bump into the open mouth of a horrible creature at this time of night, I sought out shelter in another rundown building, but not before a parade of cannibals showed up. Thankfully, the cannibals were in quite the hurry. Already preoccupied with another fresh catch of human for dinner, they didn't notice my character and her pup sneaking away behind them. It was here that I decided it would be best to camp out for the night. I didn't find any food, but at least I wasn't food for someone or something else. The pup guarded the doorway as my character dreamt of eight ounce sirloin steaks and bottomless fries. The following morning, my unnamed character and her puppy companion left the safety of the shack to continue their search for food. Meeting their most basic nutritional needs was my top priority, driving me forward towards unknown horizons. In my search to feed my sim and her pet, we passed a field of twisted metal and debris. It appeared to be a metal junkyard, or perhaps the rusted, tetanus-infused remains of a mechanical giant from a time before the current apocalyptic era. Whatever it may have been was now scattered among the rocks and dirt of the wasteland. In the distance, on top of a hill, was a tower that seemed to solemnly judge us as we walked through the dusty plains below. After walking for half of an in-game hour, I discovered the ruins of another city ahead. Surely this place has scraps of food for my character and her dog to eat, I thought. As we approached, I noticed a small group of cannibals near the entrance of the city. They appeared to be guarding the area and thankfully didn't notice my character hiding behind the iron rubble. I didn't want to wait for more cannibals to appear, so I used the surrounding wreckage as cover as I snuck around their field of view. Weaving through the rusted metal, my character and the puppy behind her silently made their way into the city ruins, one tiptoe at a time. Within the crumbling city walls were more broken down buildings. Things didn't look promising for us. This was a ghost town. I saw nothing but the hollow shells of homes in what I believed was once a thriving city. I inspected one building and found a campfire inside its dilapidated remains. Maybe there were others here not too long ago. We continued the search and found another building in decent shape. But before I was able to see what was inside, the puppy suddenly collapsed from starvation. I ordered my character to pick up the unconscious body of the pup and bring it inside the building. She gently put the dog down on a dirty mat and took a breather on a wooden stool. Another campfire inside with no one to be found. I inspected one of the small crates in the room and found jack shit. So I went to see if there was anything on the roof. The desolation and decay were now in full view up on the roof. I could see in the distance how far we've traveled and the dangers we avoided getting here. 
For all of the trouble it took to reach this place, it felt like it was all for nothing. The visceral time bomb inside my character's abdominal cavity was ticking away, threatening to knock her unconscious just like the puppy downstairs. There was no food to be found here, only death. Still unconscious, the pup dangled over my character's shoulder as we left the city ruins. I traveled down another dirt path alongside twisted metal walls when I discovered the naked, mangled remains of a cannibal ahead. Just as I went to inspect it, two large wolves approached. Luckily, they were already feasting on what looked to be human remains and ignored us. But whose remains were they? Cautiously, I crept forward towards an opening in the hills. The limp body of the starving pup dangled with each step. When I got around the corner, I found a soldier from one of the factions I saw before, attempting to revive his companion. That's when I saw it. The canyon was littered with dead bodies of men and women, a few of which were cannibals, but most were armored warriors. The survivors limped away. Some tried to save their dying friends. There must have been a faction war here not too long ago. First thing I did was put the dog down. The puppy regained consciousness and seemed to be okay for now. I went ahead and checked the bodies for loot. One by one, I rummaged through their pockets and found nothing but worn out gear. My character couldn't carry much more without it slowing her down, so I passed up on most items apart from extra bandages. I did, however, pick a bandana and an extra blade off one of the bodies. They were light enough to carry and served as extra protection for the future. Not too far behind, the pup seemed to have caught the scent of something. It ran as fast as its little legs could carry it and snatched a severed limb up off the ground and into its jaws. Excited, the pup ran around a bit before once again collapsing unconscious from starvation, with the severed arm still firmly in its mouth. Just then, I noticed a wounded swordsman limping towards one of his comrades. I saw that he was trying to resuscitate his friend, so I crept towards him while he had his attention elsewhere. I thought maybe I could get the jump on him, but before I could even react, he went limp and dropped unconscious on the ground. I decided it was time to go. I went to go pick up my dog when one of the cannibals started to move. It was severely crippled, but I didn't take any chances and attacked. The pup regained consciousness as this was happening, and instead of helping in the fight, snatched another severed arm and ran away. My character swung her enormous sword, completely missing the crippled target each time. It was only after witnessing my character's pathetic attempts to hit them did the cannibal willingly crawl right into the direction of my character's blade, killing them instantly. The pup ran back to my character with the arm still in its mouth. When it got close enough, my character scooped the pup up in her arms and threw it over her shoulder. Up the incline and out of the canyon, I continued our quest for food. We encountered a suspicious looking bug boy scavenging a couple of bodies, but walked right past him. It was until he started following us where things started to take a turn. Desperation drove the bug boy to attack us. Unable to fully defend myself with the pupper in hand, I set it down and watched as both of them went to town on the scavenger. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out here in Kenshi. Luckily for this guy, I bandaged him up before he bled to death and left him in the dust, unconscious but alive. Through another dust storm, we marched on. The puppy seemed to be doing all right after eating those severed limbs from the canyon massacre. On the other hand, the hope that I might find food in this arid plain was waning as the hunger bar of my character continued to decrease with every step. Over ridges and rocky hilltops, through dust storm after dust storm, I kept moving forward. I don't know if it was my will to survive or the masochistic high I was having from suffering in this game, but I refused to die from starvation because that would be boring, and I did not want the four hours I put into Kenshi to end dying like a bitch. The sun had set and darkness threatened my short existence once again. Will I ever catch a break? I don't know, but I wasn't going to wait to find out. When I reached the top of one of the hills, I discovered a camp nearby. It was lit up with torches, but there didn't seem to be anyone around. Upon closer inspection, I realized the camp belonged to the cannibals. Wooden poles sprouted up from the ground like trees from hell. 
I had heard that these are what the cannibals tie their victims on before chopping off their limbs. I took a risk and went ahead for a closer look. The mutilated remains of someone was still roasting at the fire pit. My character was not about to eat human flesh, even if I tried, so we quickly left the camp behind in case the cannibals returned. Not too far from the camp, I stumbled upon a book lying on the ground. Not just any book, an ancient artifact. Maybe it belonged to a victim here, now roasting over one of the fire pits. I picked it up and put it in my inventory. Perhaps I'd find a use for it later. The two waning crescent moons in the sky made everything else so much more ominous and foreboding, but within that same darkness emerged a small, singular light far off in the distance. Like a moth to a flame, I was drawn to it and walked towards the light. I passed more rusted iron ruins along the way, and in the distance, I caught my first brief glimpse of the robotic inhabitants that populate the world of Kenshi. As the sun began to rise, I saw the mechanical trio traveling nearby, exposed by the rising sun. I lost sight of them as I reached the hilltop and discovered that the light I followed came from the campfire of a humble goat trader. It was at this point in my journey where I knew I was going to be okay. Or so I thought. I was still at the Goat Shepherd's camp when one of those tech hunters appeared in the corner of my screen. Oh, hello. Suddenly, the guy gets attacked by two wolves from out of nowhere. One quick bite from one of the big doggos takes out his left arm, but he still manages to take the wolf down. Then he literally crumples down to the ground, knocking out cold from blood loss. <laughs> the surviving bone dog, Wolf Thing, turns to attack the goat shepherd. Oh, no, 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 no. I tell my character to attack only to watch her pull out her sword and do nothing, while all of the shepherd's goats group together to beat the shit out of this dog. Uh, well, oh, yeah, okay. My bone dog, who has been dubbed Flex Seal, Flex for short, scurried over to my character, Phil, short for Phyllis, both of which were named by fellow subscriber Silky Productions. As both dead bone dogs bled enough blood to fill up an entire kiddie pool, I searched their inventory to find what took two episodes to get. Food! Before I had Phil eat some heart-healthy dog meat, I had to check the hunter. Unfortunately, he died from severe blood loss. He did have a standard first aid kit in his inventory and a nice little backpack that I could use though. Things were finally looking good for once. After cooking and eating the dog meat, I noticed a fight happening in the corner of my screen. It was the cannibals again. I went over to get a closer look. What is going on over there? The cannibals were fighting one of the Robomen from the last episode. He was clearly outnumbered. Why the f are there so many of you? But he held his ground, deflecting as many attacks as he could. No stop, please chill, fam. Until ultimately collapsing to the ground in defeat. Oh, that's not good. The cannibals couldn't eat him, so they just left his mechanical corpse in the dust. I didn't want to attract the attention of any more cannibals, so I left the scene too. I said my goodbyes to the shepherd and his goats and went on my way towards the beach. It was a nice change of pace from all of the dry, dusty, sandy plains I spawned in. This was actually the first time I saw water in Kenshi before and I gotta say it was pretty nice. I even made Phil swim a little bit, you know, to wash off all of the dirt and blood from the past couple of days. Ooh, this is nice. This is real nice. And because I was genuinely curious to see if you could swim in Kenshi or not. After I had enough of watching Phil's bony ass swim for a couple of minutes, I got out of there and continued walking along the beach. I hate to admit it, but I sure do love me some long walks on the beach. This was honestly the first time I didn't feel like I was going to be attacked in Kenshi. It was surprisingly peaceful. I was enjoying my beach side stroll when I noticed movement in the distance. When I got closer, I saw two shepherds with both of their herd of goats trailing behind them. I spoke to one of them and saw that they were selling some goats. I wouldn't mind having a small goat companion, so I took a look at the prices. Over 13000 for a goat? I didn't have that kind of money, so I left and continued my journey. It started to rain immediately after I left the shepherds. Just then, I saw what looked like tents in the distance. Oh, hello. Please be friendly. Through the rain, I approached the encampment and saw quite a few soldiers, along with one or two dead cannibals. Some were manning mounted turrets. Others were sitting around campfires under the tents. I went up to a group of them and found out that they were, in fact, 
cannibal hunters. Apparently, they had set up shop in the area and hunted down any cannibal within range of their turrets. The unlucky ones were eaten alive by their massive hunting dogs. I like these guys, so I tagged along with one of their hunting parties. Apparently, one of the villages in the area had quite the cannibal problem, so they were heading towards there to clear them out. Lo and behold, I saw the village far off in the distance. <gasps> yes! Civilization? It was pretty incredible. The sun was setting behind it and it created a really nice silhouette. The windmills were a nice touch too. I couldn't wait to head over there and take it easy for once. Of course, I still followed the cannibal hunters just in case there were any man-eaters in the area that could possibly murder me between here and the village. With the sun going down, it was cannibal hunting time. I wasn't officially part of the cannibal hunters myself, but I'd like to think I was kind of an intern. Nevertheless, I followed the squad of hunters further into the night. We passed a body, then two, until we encountered a whole tribe of dead cannibals littering the area. The cannibal hunters and I followed the trail of bodies, which led me closer and closer to the village. Just then, we were ambushed. Oh, shit. The cannibals emerged from the cover of night and attacked us. A couple of the hunters jumped in front and attacked with their swords while the others shot the cannibals with their crossbows. I went ahead and took out any stragglers I could find. Even against a single wounded cannibal, Phil was no match by herself. But with the help of Flex, they both managed to bring down the cannibal. Uh, where do you think you're going? A few more cannibals appeared, but they didn't stand a chance against the hunters. They overpowered the cannibals and even saved someone from being cannibal food. The hunters left no survivors and continued their patrol. After a quick patch up, I followed them for a bit before eventually splitting off from the group and made my way towards the village. I was greeted by a blinding floodlight mounted near the entrance. With all of the cannibals in the area, I was surprised to see that the way here was so open despite having such large walls surrounding it. There weren't any guards posted at all. In fact, no one was around. Then again, it was late and everyone was probably asleep. I made my way through the village and saw that the doors to the bar were still open. I wonder if anyone's inside. Inside the cold metal cavity of the village bar were the late night bar goers. I went up to the bartender, sold my heavy ass sword for some cash, and paid for one of the beds they had available. After two episodes of walking, running, looting, fighting, I finally get to recover from all of the insane things Kenshi throws at you. But I have to say, I was pretty lucky. Horrible things happen in Kenshi, often and at random. But so do the good things, and that's what made finding refuge in this village so satisfying. The story of Phil and Flex Tape doesn't end here, though. After resting in the village bar, I went to the local shop to see what I could afford. What I bought was more food, specifically dried fish. This was a fishing village, after all. Unfortunately, it wasn't cheap, and I found myself broke once again. Oh my! There's no money in here. It was time to find a job. I needed money if I wanted to survive. Other than bounty hunting, there aren't any preset jobs you can do to make money in Kenshi. You kind of make up your own way to earn your keep around here. So I decided that I was going to clean up the area. Literally, scavenging the bodies outside of the village for anything I could sell back to the trader in town. It was also a good excuse to train up my combat skills. Come on, really? Whenever the opportunity presented itself, I picked off any weak and wounded cannibal I found. Finally. The cannibals were extremely prevalent in this area, but where there were cannibals, there were also cannibal hunters. It was the same group of hunters that led me to the village, and I joined in on the fight whenever I could. Hey. These guys were pretty great, and I was glad to be fighting alongside them again. My character, Phil, was still weak and would get knocked down easily, but she always got back up and kept fighting. With every hit she took, her toughness skill increased, improving her ability to take a beating and survive. The cannibals were no match against the organized, battle-hardened ranks of the cannibal hunters and their huge mountain dogs. It was during one of these skirmishes that I encountered a new faction called the Flotsam Ninjas. They didn't seem to like the cannibals either. Sometimes the cannibals would become ballsy enough to raid the village. The cannibals seemed to attack almost every other day, roaming the outskirts in droves, looking for anyone to bring back to their camps to feed their numbers. Thankfully, when the cannibal hunters weren't around, 
Friendlier factions, like the Flotsam Ninjas and the occasional Roaming Skeleton, were enough to dispatch the cannibals. Even so, the village often sustained some casualties during these raids. My job was simple. Fight when I could, pick off the weak and wounded, scavenge the loot, heal any villagers to train my first aid skills, and sell my findings for the money. I used my earnings to buy enough food for both Flex and Phil, and saved the rest. I knew I needed more money whenever I decided to leave the village in the future and travel the rest of the world. Maybe I could buy a couple of goats and start a goat farm somewhere. Or perhaps I would start my own trade route and become a wandering trader, selling my goods to different factions across the map. More than likely, I could even become a full-fledged cannibal hunter, but I would need to prove myself first. I needed to become stronger. One day, I noticed a large group of cannibals attacking some ninjas outside the village walls. Things didn't look good for the ninjas, as I watched the cannibal horde overpower them. The ninjas were completely outnumbered in this fight. For every ninja, there was three cannibals attacking them at once. Despite having little to no armor and only using crude weaponry, the cannibals were able to easily cut down most of the defending ninjas. I focused my camera on Flex and had him help out the ninjas. Fighting back was a great way to improve his skills in combat and also buy time for backup to arrive. More ninjas appeared and managed to push the remaining cannibals back. It wasn't long before the last cannibal was taken down. The rest had either fled or were too wounded to run away. I made sure to have Flex eliminate the few that remained and watched as he chased down the ones that tried to crawl away. Even though he was only a puppy, Flex was strong enough to inflict a lot of damage. Now that's a lot of damage! After the fight was over, I found out that Phil had been badly wounded and was totally unconscious. What the f happened? Hey. Apparently, while I was focused on Flex, I had forgotten that Phil was set on auto attack and must have tried attacking the cannibals off screen. Oh, wow. One of the ninjas was in the process of applying first aid to her before it got any worse. Unfortunately, there must have been more cannibals in the area because the ninja stopped healing Phil and left her behind, still unconscious on the ground. There wasn't much I could do at this point. Phil was bandaged up but would be knocked out cold for a while due to blood loss. The most I could have hoped for was one of the villagers to find and carry her body back to the bar. I was powerless at this point and watched as the sun began to set. I had Flex guard Phil's body and waited for whatever was to come out of the darkness. Unfortunately for me, this meant that I had to wait hours for her to regain consciousness, as I had set the chance of death setting in the beginning to three. This setting directly affects wound degeneration and blood loss. The higher the number, the more likely to die. Thankfully. Phil only suffered a minor concussion. Others in the village were not so lucky. There were bodies littering the village floor. Some were cannibals, others were villagers. Through heavy rain, I watched as one particular villager limped towards the bar. He was carrying one of the wounded ninjas from the battle against the cannibals earlier that day. It would be a while until Phil regained consciousness. During this waiting period, I noticed a few cannibals waking up from their own coma, attempting to crawl away. So I sent Flex over there to take care of them as a safety precaution. When I said it would take hours for Phil to regain consciousness, I meant it. Many in-game hours passed. I watched the sunrise. Villagers were now up and going about their day. It even rained a few more times. For immersion's sake, I'd like to think that the villagers failed to notice that Phil was still unconscious on the ground. I couldn't blame them. Phil's body blended in well with the fly-infested corpses nearby. So I left my computer on and made lunch. When I came back, Phil was regaining consciousness. I watched as she struggled to get back on her feet. As she began patching herself up, Flex appeared, happy to see his companion awake once again. While the bandages did help Phil heal some of her wounds, she still needed 
to rest. Her left arm was pretty banged up and needed more time to properly heal in one of the beds. I watched her shuffle into town towards the bar, with Flex trailing behind her. It seemed that it was too early in the game for any of the NPCs to be awake at the time. I did notice that all of the bodies that had been left from the battle with the cannibals had been disposed of. Inside the bar, I rented another bed for Phil to rest in. Her arm was going to take another couple of real life minutes to recover from. While I was waiting, I took this opportunity to observe the other occupants of the bar. The crowd here was pretty diverse. There were fishermen, mercenaries, and tech hunters all sitting together. Not to mention varying races like this Shek man here. After a couple of minutes, Phil was now fully recovered, and so I began to sell any of the leftover loot I had from the cannibals. It wasn't much, just their crude weaponry, but it did net me a good amount of money to live off of. Six days in-game had officially passed. With Phil fully recovered, it was time to get back on the grind. If I wanted to progress beyond this village, I was going to need more money. I continued to have Phil hunt down any cannibals nearby. She was getting better at using her katana. Then again, her targets didn't really put up much of a fight. It wasn't long after this that I experienced yet another cannibal raid on the village. This time, however, the mercenaries that we saw earlier had decided to come out of the bar and fight back. It was apparent that they won this fight. I saw a few of them scrambling to recover their wounded allies. I came back to the village and saw blood everywhere. There were cannibals lying in a pool of their own blood. Others had simply slumped over and died. Among the bodies of the recently deceased, I noticed one of the residents lying on the ground. They were still alive and needed healing, so I made Phil bandage them up. It helped to increase her first aid skill, which I thought might prove useful in the future. Learning how to heal faster and more efficiently meant a better chance of survival in the world of Kenshi. Another day, another raid. A large group of starving bandits had become ballsy enough to attack the village. They were considerably weaker than the cannibals, but their sheer numbers and desperation for food still made them a threat. Inside one of the houses, Phil was fighting off a bandit, while Flex was fighting off another outside. Compared to how they were at the start of the game, both of their combat skills had greatly improved as they easily held back their attackers. Phil's dodging skills had also improved, as well as her ability to take damage without getting knocked out. She still needed some work in the katana department, but together with Flex, they were both able to take down the remaining bandit. Taking the fight back outside, it was obvious that the bandits were losing this battle. They were no match for the mercenaries and the village guards. One by one, the bandits were cut down, until there was only one left. But that didn't last long either. Afterwards, everyone went back to their posts, and I continued as normal. But honestly, at this point in my playthrough, I was starting to feel a bit tired of the same routine over and over again. Sure, hunting cannibals were great, and it was a good way for me to improve Phil's skills over time, but I wanted to experience more of what Kenshi had to offer. The only thing preventing me from leaving was that I knew Phil and Flex weren't going to survive out in the wilds alone. Several in-game days later, I encountered yet another cannibal raid just just outside of the village walls. Their targets of the day weren't the fishermen of the village, but a group of traders passing through. I had Phil intervene, but it was clear that the traders didn't need any help. The caravan guards, as well as their huge hulking packing mules, had no trouble absolutely annihilating all of the cannibals in their way. After a surprisingly quick fight, the trading caravan went back to business as usual, leaving behind a massive pile of bloody corpses. That is the exact moment I realized I needed to be a part of this. This is exactly how I was going to leave the village. I figured I could be a part of their caravan troop and made myself an honorary caravan guard. The fishing village will always have a place in my heart, but it was time to leave. I had no idea where this caravan was going to take me or where we would end up, 
I guess that was just part of the adventure. At the end of the day, it didn't really matter where I was going. I was just excited to finally be a part of a brand new adventure. The fishing village that had done such a great job of sheltering my characters was now far behind me. Now, my eyes were set on new horizons. There appeared to be nothing but dry, dusty mountains for miles and miles. But you know, that's okay. I was with the merchant caravan, and they obviously knew where they were going, so, you know, I was going to be okay. We actually ended up on one of the dry, dusty mountains and encountered some friendly wildlife. Apparently, we had stumbled upon a den of bone dogs. They seemed pretty hungry. The white-furred alpha bone dog seemed to be especially hungry. Unfortunately, the merchant caravan didn't have anything to spare, so they decided it would be best to put it down. To my surprise, the white bone dog was so tough that it took about three of us, plus my own bone dog, to finally take it down. Afterwards, I had my character Phil patch up her bone dog Flex with some bandages. Then I realized that the merchant caravan had left us. They were so far ahead that I could barely see them in the distance. As I got closer to one of the stragglers lagging behind, it started to rain. The sun was also setting giving everything an orange tint. In the distance, I could see the fishing village, its two windmills still spinning away. One of the greatest aspects of Kenshi is how seamless it is. Its world just continues, with or without you. Eventually, after having Phil run at full speed, we finally caught up to the caravan. The sun was setting in the distance, and once again, I was taken back by just how beautiful this game could be. Granted, I did have shader mods on at the time, as well as a mod to increase the foliage and the view distance cranked up to maximum, but those are simply enhancements to this already charming handcrafted game. At this part of my journey, the sun had completely set, and it appeared that we were approaching the first stop on this trade route. I was pretty excited to explore a new town, until I realized something was off. When we arrived at the foot of the town, the caravan stopped. At first, I thought this was typical caravan behavior. But upon closer inspection, I realized that we were alone. There was no one, not a soul in sight. Perhaps everyone in the town was asleep, I thought. Then the merchant said this, Nothing of value here, Outlander. What? What did the merchant mean? I needed to know what happened, so I went on the Kenshi wiki and found something on the Ghost Village. According to its description, the Ghost Village is implied to have been recently raided by cannibals. As a result, the buildings are deserted, yet full of items. It is one bar and six residences. And with that, the merchant was right. There was nothing for us here, so we left and continued through the rain to a destination unknown. After a while, the rain stopped. The sky was now clear and full of stars. Some of the caravan members were still hurt after the wolf attack. Despite limping, they kept up with the rest of the group. Even that one member that had been lagging behind this entire time still tried to catch up. Once again, I had no idea where we were going. After stopping at the ghost village, I was sure that we were going to go back to the fishing village. But here we were, traveling through what appeared to be a path cut through the mountains. We would continue on this path all through the night and into the morning. As we finally made our way out of the canyon, I couldn't help but immediately notice the huge mountain in the distance. Then I realized the environment around me was shifting. The dry, arid plains and mountain ridges that I had grown so accustomed to were now replaced by green grass and actual trees. For the first time in my Kenshi playthrough, I found myself in a forest. Honestly, this experience would have been really nice had I not been immediately attacked by a group of cannibals. These cannibals seemed different 
they were smaller and noticeably scrawnier, but they were fast and quickly outnumbered us. One of them was even able to block almost all of Phil's attacks before succumbing to Phil and Flex's teamwork. The cannibals made a fatal mistake when they decided to ambush us, having already witnessed what the caravan guards were capable of. It was no surprise to me to watch this cannibal get absolutely destroyed so quickly. As you can see, the rest of the tribe was given the same kind of treatment. After our brief encounter with those forest cannibals, we got back on the dirt path and continued our journey through this forest. The sheer scale of some of these trees made my character and the rest of the caravan look like ants crawling on the ground. The dirt path became steeper, and it appeared that we were going uphill. At the top, the path led us to an open field. But we didn't stop there. It began to rain as we climbed even higher. I didn't realize it at first, but when I saw the tops of the mountains in the horizon, I realized how high we actually were. This wasn't a hill we were climbing. This was a mountain. Eventually, we reached some kind of entrance in the mountain. It led us to an even narrower pathway. When we finally reached the very top, I saw the wall. There were floodlights and mounted turrets on this wall. There were also armed guards that turned to greet us as we approached. I would have never found this place on my own if I didn't follow the caravan. Who knew there was a place hidden in the mountains? Once we got past the guards and made it inside the wall, the sky opened up and an entire cityscape was revealed to me. The merchant caravan had taken me from the shores of the fishing village all the way to the top of a mountain city called World's End. It was here where I ended my pact with the merchant caravan. It was fun while it lasted, but I think it was time I started a caravan of my own. After parting ways with the merchant caravan, I spent the rest of the day replenishing my rations at the local bar and acquiring new gear for my character. The city had a weapon shop dedicated entirely to a wide variety of crossbows. At first, I was going to buy a crossbow with longer range so that I could potentially snipe enemies from afar, while my bone dog companion tanked. Instead, I opted for a more shotgun-like model that compensated its short range for more damage. Following my shopping spree, I went back to the bar and rented out a bunk for the night. Nearly two in-game days of traveling had passed since my character had a chance to rest. In Kenshi, some wounds would only fully heal during sleep. It wasn't enough that the city was hidden at the top of the mountain. All day and all night, there were heavily armored guards posted outside of the city walls, always on watch for whatever or whoever gets to the top. The next morning, I noticed a large group of armed men making their way through the center of the city. Based on their attire, it appeared that they weren't from World's End. It soon became apparent that this wasn't a holiday trip for these men. Without warning, they drew their swords and began attacking people on the streets. Crossbows were pulled out, and any onlooker on the street was targeted. It was pure chaos. Soon after the fighting broke out, a group of mercenaries, as well as a ninja clan, dived out of the bars and fought the invaders back. Then, a couple of city guards realized their error in allowing these men in and jumped in the fight. After a couple of intense minutes of stabbing and swordplay, all the assailants were down. Blood, bodies, and body parts could be seen all over the area. My character had been sleeping during the entire fight and was just now leaving the bar. Outside, the result of the battle left several mutilated corpses on the ground. For my character Phil, this was just another opportunity to loot and sell the spoils. I was a professional scavenger at this point. I've probably looted several hundred bodies to fund new equipment, medical supplies, and food for my character. For me, this was just another day in Kenshi. Until the body you happen to be looting off of gets back up and starts to attack you. Luckily, others reacted quickly to any survivors with a couple more rounds of merciless stabbings. When I had looted as much as my character could carry, I went back to the shop to sell it all. 